But I wanted to introduce Jason Blackstock. We're really glad to have him on campus. And also, uh, I announced this to the students in my class, but also tomorrow night he's giving a talk uh, in Gallagher's business building in 123 at 7.30 on the title, Managing Our Living Planet, Exploring the Evolving World of Science and Public Decision. Uh, Jason is a trained physicist, and I think I don't know, as far as economics, we might have made a bad choice leaving the Silicon Valley where he uh, started out. Uh, he had a PhD in physics, but also went back to school and went to the Kennedy School at Harvard and studied public affairs. And from that, he's sort of a, you know, a man around the planet, traveling all over the place, doing work on science and public affairs, and particularly focusing a lot on geoengineering, where he's probably one of the most informed people on the planet on this particular topic. I don't know. I think that's probably fair to say. Um, and so Jason is on his way to where he's going to be spending uh, the next year or however long at Oxford and Cambridge working on science policy, energy policy, and climate change. Kind of lucky to grab him in, uh, in as many travels have him come here. So welcome, Jason Blackstock. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, and it's a real pleasure to be here. So I, uh, I've had the privilege of uh, getting to work a little bit with Dane and Wiley Carr and a few other people here on some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today, actually, about geoengineering. So uh, as Dane said, I'm giving a talk tomorrow night on the interface of, of science and public policy. This is one example, one of the examples that I actually spend a lot of my time working on these days because of its importance uh, in relation to climate science. Now, let me start by asking a question. How many of you know what geoengineering is? Okay, about uh, half, maybe a little bit more. Um, and the rest of you have never heard of it before or barely know. So what I'll do is I'll start by doing a quick introduction to the idea. So what, one of the things, uh, this is meant to be sort of an informal conversation more than my lecturing at you. So if you have questions along the way, please interrupt and, and jump in. Uh, what I really want to talk about and spend a little bit of time chatting with you about in, in the later half of this is uh, some of the ethical dimensions around this. Because I know this is an area of, of particular expertise here that Dane's done work on and, and Wiley's working on. Other people here have thought about the ethical dimensions of climate change. And geoengineering is adding new dimensions to that. Ways for intentionally managing the climate system raise new ethical dimensions above and beyond the already challenging ones that we're facing with, uh, with the changes to our climate that are impacting vulnerable populations around the world. And so I want to focus in a little bit on whether or not these new ideas for geoengineering are going to make some of the global inequities that we deal with right now worse or whether they might be able to make them better. So I'll start out by introducing what these ideas are for those of you who haven't talked about them and I'll skim through that as quickly as possible. Again, raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, and uh, then we'll get to some of the nitty gritty about how people are thinking about th these issues internationally and how we might actually end up making decisions about them, the sort of political decisions that shape our, uh, that will be shaping our climate future. So before I jump into, uh, I, I will spend uh, most of the introduction talking about technologies, new novel ideas for manipulating the climate system. But I want to start with a quick introductory story. Uh, an introductory story about the way we are modifying the climate system today, the sort of things that we're already doing to it, somewhat unintentionally, that we may want to think more carefully about because it relates to the sort of intentional climate management we're building. So I'll, the evolving story of sulfur and climate. Now, right now, how many of you have heard of acid rain? There we go. So at least a, a foundation that we all can start from. Acid rain is caused by the emission of sulfur particles, generally from the burning of fossil fuels. Um, and the, the sulfur that goes up into the clouds, up into the troposphere, ends up raining out within uh, a couple of days of going up into the clouds. And that is what was contributing to acid rain, the, the severe acid rain problems we were starting to have in the 1980s here in North America and is now starting to emerge again in Asia because of the, uh, the uh, fossil fuels that they burn with high sulfur content. Now, 
these sulfur particles also did another thing. And you, I'm sure you're all well aware of haze, so the sort of uh, air pollution haze that you see in Los Angeles and some of the main cities. That's related to the same sorts of particles. These sorts of sulfur emissions create small particles in the air that will eventually rain out, but these cause respiratory illness. Now, we've been trying, the international environmental community has been trying to phase out sulfur pollution from all sorts of different uh, emission sources. We've done a fairly good job within North America and Europe of phasing them out from domestic sources. But one of the areas where there has still been a large sulfur emission is in, sh in shipping on the, high, on the high seas. Basically, the ships on the high seas burn something called bunker fuel. Bunker fuel is sort of the dredge that's left at the bottom of the barrel when you're refining other sorts of petroleum products. And this often has a high sulfur content. Now, for the most part, when this is emitted out over the oceans, it's not a huge problem. It doesn't contribute much to ocean acidification because it's just a small amount. But it does contribute a lot to air pollution in the local cities, in these port cities where these ships come in. And so the IMO made a decision we can get the slides to go. The International Maritime Organization made a decision that it wants to reduce the amount of sulfur allowed in bunker fuel over the next decade. It's going to reduce it by almost an order of magnitude, by a factor of 10. Uh, its current levels are allowed 4.5% sulfur. That's quite a lot. And by 2020, they want it as low as 0.5% everywhere over the oceans and uh, even lower, 0.1% in some port city areas. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm, I'm talking about geoengineering, I'm talking about climate change, but I'm starting with a story about sulfur air pollution and a decision that was made in order to preserve lives. Because the reason they made this decision was it's going to save somewhere around 35,000 lives a year. 35,000 premature deaths will be avoided from these port going cities. But there's a catch. This decision was made by the International Maritime Organization, Organization for really good reasons to save these lives. But there's a climate impact to this as well. These same sulfur particles that have been contributing to acid rain and contribute to local air pollution and, and respiratory illness also have, right now, a cooling effect on our climate system. Now, this is a chart from IPCC AR4. It has all the different major constituents that human beings put up into the atmosphere that create some sort of forcing of our climate system. You don't need to go through it in detail. You can look this one up. I'm gonna, I just want to hone your attention down to two factors. The first is CO2, which we all know quite well, driving climate change. And there's two things that I want to draw your attention to. Obviously, this is a warming agent. It's red and to the right, which means it's increasing the amount of energy that's trapped in our climate system and warming it up. And the small error bars. We know relatively well how much forcing CO2 has been adding to our atmosphere. There's small error bars associated with uh, some of the feedbacks within the climate system. But for the most part, we understand that quite well. One thing we do not understand well, though, is the impact of these aerosols, these sulfur particles. Sulfur particles aren't the only one, but they're a dominant one. These, air, these uh, forcing numbers represent the amount of cooling these aerosol particles create on the climate system. They do this in two ways. First off, they form effectively tiny little bubbles, microscopic bubbles, that when the sunlight comes in from, from the atmosphere and hits them, some of it gets reflected back, into the, back away from the Earth and so not absorbed by the climate system. Now, the sun is obviously what heats us up from absolute zero, other from, from very close to being at the temperature of space. So as a result, the, this sort of reflection away is actually reducing the amount of heat our system absorbs and cooling us off. Now it also, these particles interact with clouds, and by interacting with clouds, they sometimes make them bigger and they sometimes make them brighter. Basically, the more cloud cover you have, the less sunlight reaches the ground, the less gets absorbed by the oceans and the surface or the atmosphere, and the cooler we get. Now, this cooling impact, it's why it's blue and to the right, um, has very large error bars associated with it. Now, these error bars associated are because the microphysics of clouds are very difficult to understand. But in a sh quick summary, you can't just add these together linearly. These are the two different effects. But in short, this cooling effect is right now masking the global warming that we should otherwise have already experienced because of CO2 alone. Now, we know the climate system is getting warmer. This uh, is possibly one of the warmest uh, winters I've ever experienced. I'm from Edmonton, just came down from up there. Um, and uh, it is an exceptionally warm uh, winter. But this is just one example of the sort of climate change that's going on. What we don't know is how much of this warming from CO2 we've seen. We might have only, because of this cooling effect, if you're at the low end of these error bars, we might have already seen 80% of the warming that we're committed to because of CO2. 
But if we're at the high end of these error bars, in other words, if this cooling effect is very significant, we could actually have experienced so far only 30 or 40 percent of the warming that, we're, that we've committed to because of the CO2 emissions. And because the IMO has decided to phase out sulfur emissions, this isn't sulfur emissions everywhere, but this is about 30% of the total sulfur emissions around the world right now happens on the high seas. Removing that sulfur from the atmosphere is going to begin unmasking the climate system. It's going to begin revealing some of this extra warming. And we don't quite know how much. What does this mean? Basically, the, the, the climate impact of this can be measured in watts per square meters, 0.3 watts per square meters. To put it in, in, in uh, rough terms, 1.7 watts per square meters is how much CO2 has warmed our climate system up. 0.3 watts per square meter, plus or minus 0.2 because of the error bars, basically means that this one decision, so if you skip over all the numbers and just get to the, the, the meat of this, this one decision by an international governance organization made in order to save lives in port cities is going to be adding warming to our climate system equivalent to about a decade's worth of carbon and current emissions. Now, that's a very significant warming impact. And it was a decision made by an international governance body without considering the climate ramifications. As a result of this, people are now, there's a whole bunch of reasons for this, and it goes to some of the things I'll talk about in a few minutes with the governance of geoengineering or the governance of climate change. There are a whole bunch of interrelated issues that raise different ethical issues, that raise different uh, scientific challenges in, sort of in terms of untangling what the final goals we're trying to achieve with our various policies are. This one has a goal of, re of saving lives due to air pollution, but what are going to be the impacts, particularly for vulnerable populations, of accelerated climate change? Now, how does this relate to geoengineering? This one decision, having uh, been made, by, made two years ago and being implemented this decade, is going to have one of the largest impacts on the climate system of any decision that has so far been made. Even more potentially, yeah? How does that differ from, um, I mean, you talked about the decision being made uh, and having a pretty localized effect on port cities, but how yeah. does that transfer to the global climate system? It transfers to the global system for another, so that, that's a perfect question because it, it, it blends right into the conversation about geoengineering. It transfers to the global because not only do these ships come within, come into the port cities, you know, they, they, they're locally impacting the port city when they're within about 200 miles of the coast. But they're talking, the decision that they have passed is to reduce sulfur emissions everywhere. And most of the time, these ships spend over the, over the deep oceans, over the high seas. And if you look at satellite pictures, which I don't have one in this presentation, but I can show you afterwards, you see ship tracks of clouds that are created. Those, those ship tracks demonstrate the broad impact of these sulfur out over the deep ocean. And that cooling impact over the deep ocean is what makes this more global. Now, the local impact of the cooling is even greater. When you have a cloud come overhead, you feel the impact of that right away on whether or not you're warmed up or not. So obviously the impact on the oceans will be even higher than the global average. But on a global average, when you add it together, it's still very significant. So it translates through not only the local impacts, but through the global warming that we experience. Um, the reason I start with this story in trying to, in, before I jump into geoengineering technologies, is geoengineering, when I start explaining to you the sort of ideas, seems radical. It seems uh, almost preposterous that we're thinking about developing technologies for controlling the global climate system. But if we only think about them as technologies for controlling the global climate system, separate from the reality that we are making decisions with institutions that exist today, which will have as much impact as any of these technologies we're talking about, and so far, we're not necessarily doing them very intelligently. So if you, when, when we start thinking about ways we could change this policy, for example, by not having them uh, emit sulfur when they're within the, the coastal zone, but allowing them to emit sulfur when they're out over the deep ocean, or possibly even, what if we increased the amount of sulfur they're emitting over the deep ocean in order to cool the climate system down just a little bit more because we don't want to experience the extra global warming? Now you're starting to get into a conversation about managing the climate system or engineering the radiative balance of the climate system. Even if you're not talking about, this is no new technology. This is shipping vessels with smokestacks and we're gonna build a lot more of them in the next 20 to 40 years given the amount of international shipping that we continue to ramp up. 
So it's a big lever on the climate system using existing technologies. With that, now let me introduce the concept of geoengineering and the technologies in that bubble. And, why, and, and we'll dive in a little bit to some of the ethical and governance issues that it raises, uh, and then hopefully have some time to talk about it. So what is geoengineering? It should more accurately be called climate engineering, because it's really talking about engineering the climate system. That's what these ideas focus on. Um, geoengineering is a historical name for a variety of reasons that I won't go into. But essentially, it refers to the deliberate and large-scale alteration of the climate system. Now, on their own, either one of these is not particularly novel. We're sitting in a nice room that, well, today it's not all that cold outside, but you know, in normal winter times, if we didn't engineer our local climate, we wouldn't be very happy living in Missoula or in Canada or anywhere else. So we do the deliberate manipulation of our environments and climate all the time. We also do the large scale alteration of our climate system. I mentioned one of them with sulfur emissions, CO2, but it's the combination of these two. It's adding intentionality at the global scale, the large regional to global scale, which actually starts to make this very novel. We're not just talking about reducing our impact at the global scale. We're talking about methods for intentionally increasing our impact in particular ways that may have what people, some people would consider to be positive benefits, obviously with potential side effects. I'm going to talk about one specific type of geoengineering technology today, um, solar geoengineering in particular. And uh, uh, happy to talk further about other geoengineering ideas, but I want to focus on this because it raises the broadest ethical issues and the biggest governance challenges. In the past six months, uh, Dane uh, uh, was talking a little bit about my travels. I have been on uh, every continent except for Antarctica and Australia talking with leading policymakers and scientists about these, about particularly solar geoengineering because of the sorts of governance challenges that they raise, because of the concerns about what these technologies might do. Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991 and injected 10 million tons of sulfur into the stratosphere. Now this sulfur is very similar to the sorts of sulfur that I was talking about before, only it was injected by a volcano rather than man, and it was injected above the clouds. So remember, all the pollution I talked about is effectively goes into the clouds, what's called the troposphere, and it rains out within a few days. But by, by being so powerful an explosion, injecting it above the clouds, these particles stayed up in the atmosphere for a longer period in time because they didn't get caught in the clouds and rain out. They stayed up there for about 18 months. This actually shows a plot against the years that erupted in 1991. And this top plot shows aerosol optical thickness. It just shows the measurement of those aerosols in the atmosphere and how they fell out with a half-life of about 18 months. Now, who cares? We care because those sulfur particles in the stratosphere did exactly what the sulfur I was talking about in the troposphere does. It reflected sunlight away from the planet and cooled the climate system off. In 1992, uh, 1992 to 1993, the global average temperature was half a degree centigrade cooler. It cooled the planet by half a degree Celsius. Very similar to what the, sort of, what the, what the pollution aerosols are doing, but it doesn't come with the issues of local haze because it's, it's up in the stratosphere, and it doesn't come with the issues of acid rain because there's so much less of it. Because when you inject it in the stratosphere, each particle staying up there for 100 times longer means you need 100 times less for the same cooling impact. So it had a much greater impact per particle than the sort of pollution, uh, air pollution that we put up right now. So this, led, this sort of idea, these are some of the details about it that I, I won't talk about right now, but this, observing this volcano and a handful of others, there are dozens of others that have happened historically that have created this sort of cooling effect, it led scientists to ask, well, if volcanoes can cool the planet accidentally, and we're cooling it with air pollution right now accidentally, why couldn't we potentially cool it intentionally? If one of the big challenges with CO2 and, is the global warming component of it and what that global warming does to agriculture, societies, ecosystems, um, what would, what, if we cooled the climate system using these sorts of aerosol particles, what would the impacts be? So the first thing scientists started with are, well, how would we do it? Nuclear bombs in volcanoes, probably a bad idea. So thankfully, they moved past that quite quickly. But a whole range of engineering explorations were kicked off by that. Um, these have ranged from uh, tubes going up into the, uh, up 40 kilometers into the atmosphere, high altitude balloons. My personal favorite is the howitzer, the naval gun. You point it straight up in the air, it'll fire a shell up to 40 or 50 kilometers. The, the top of the troposphere is 20 to 30 kilometers, so you can get things well above the clouds. Airplanes are probably by far the most feasible. 
But what these engineering studies showed, the most important thing that they showed was how easy it would be to inject these sorts of particles up into the stratosphere. For a cost of around a billion dollars to $10 billion a year, and actually there's evidence that even a billion dollars may be a high estimate, that for less than a billion dollars, you could cool the climate system by as much as Mount Pinatubo. Now, what does that mean? That means that given the fact that these are all existing technologies, there we go, these are all existing technologies and this sort of a price tag, this is within the reach of a single nation to do. There's even papers out there suggesting you could have Greenfinger, a, a, a Bond-type villain, building his own for less than a billion dollars a year and cooling the climate system off. Now, that's pretty unrealistic from the point of view that you, know, you have to keep injecting these particles over and over again, at least with this design, in order to cool the climate system down. But one can even imagine, you know, salt, why did people think of sulfur? They thought about sulfur because we do it accidentally and, the, and volcanoes do it accidentally, so we have a pretty good idea of what the impact overall would be, at least of, of the sulfur raining out, because we've had that. But why couldn't you design your own designer nanoparticles in order to stay up there permanently? That starts to raise all sorts of governance and ethical challenges as to who's going to control this technology and how. Now, if this were actually a, a solution to climate change, if cooling the climate system down with sulfur aerosols simply perfectly offset the climate change caused by CO2, well, we probably wouldn't need the UNFCCC negotiations, the IPCC would be a small company selling sulfur injections, and this would be solved. But the reality is, is far more complicated than that. I'm not going to go into all the science right now, but suffice it to say, when you heat up a pot of water on a stove, just by one degree Celsius, the amount of evaporation that comes off of that, the amount of extra evaporation is very small. But when you take a heat lamp, a, 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 a high powered lamp, and you're shining it on the surface of the water, and you turn down that, that, the, uh, the intensity of that light, the reduction in the amount of, of water that comes off is greater than what you get from simply uh, raising the temperature by one degree from the heat underneath. In other words, when you cool the planet down you, by reflecting sunlight away and you heat the planet up by putting a blanket on it with CO2, you're going to change the climate patterns as well. It's not going to be the same change you would get from CO2 warming it up. And it might be that the overall magnitude of change is smaller. So things like precipitation patterns are going to change, where and how much water is evaporated and then rains out in different locations. The diurnal cycle, the temperature change from day to night is going to be different because CO2 traps the sort of infrared heat that's emitted even during the nighttime, but the sunlight obviously isn't there during the nighttime. So there's going to be a change in the balance between, of, the, of the diurnal cycle. These are subtle on local scales, but when they add up at a global scale and you start propagating these things, the net impact on the climate system through what's often referred to as telekinetic impacts. In other words, you've all heard a butterfly flaps its wings in China, we get a storm out here in the US. Those sorts of telekinetic impacts, the complexity of the climate system means that this sort of tinkering with the energy balance will create all sorts of different climatic changes. And because we don't have a lot of historical experience with long-term cooling with sulfur in this way, what those impacts will be are fairly uncertain. Climate is just more, is more than just a global response. The regional responses will be magnified in a lot of cases. Regional changes in precipitation, interannual variability, plant productivity. Again, I'm not going to spend much time going through this list, but suffice it to say, by changing the type of climate change you get, you also change who wins and who loses. I come from Canada. In Canada right now, uh, climate change is a very uh, an interesting political issue, to say the least, unfortunately. Um, but one of the things that climate change is bringing about in Canada is exploration of, of the Northwest Passage. You know, the shipping route uh, across, and, and there have been debates about Arctic sovereignty, who's going to control the Northwest Passage, who's going to develop any energy resources that are found in the North. In other words, climate change and the changes in the Arctic is being perceived, to some people at any rate, as a benefit. Now, you cool the climate system down, suddenly that benefit goes away for them, even though there's a different benefit that might be gained by other populations which are suffering from precipitation changes, heat changes, etc. This, this is why these sorts of geoengineering technologies are far from a panacea solution. They're not a substitute for avoiding further committed climate change, for avoiding CO2 emissions, 
but they're being talked about now because of the concerns about how much climate change we have committed to. Um, I'll skip past that one in the interest of time. So why is geoengineering being discussed today? If it's not a solution, why, if it doesn't replace our need to mitigate carbon dioxide emissions, to reduce our impact, why would scientists even start talking about this? Until about 2006, actually, scientists had almost a taboo on talking about geoengineering. In the global climate discourse, there was mitigation in the early 1990s, and that was all that was talked about. Adaptation got introduced to the global agenda in the late 90s and early 2000s when developing countries stood up and said, hey, we're already suffering changes from the impacts of climate change now. We need those taken into account in the framework we develop for how to deal with this. But in the, in the decades since adaptation was added, there's been increasing evidence that first off, we're not actually mitigating. The politics on this are stuck. This is a, a, the, the scenarios that are presented there, those rainbow colored lines are the scenarios projected by the IPCC with the overlaid curve of global emissions. You see the, the positive climate impact of the global recession that kicked in in and around 2008, but you also see how fast our global economy recovered in terms of its emissions at any rate, even though our, our, our productivity of the economy hasn't necessarily, because people turn to dirtier fuels. In other words, we haven't at all made progress on mitigating some of the, the worst trajectory, the business as usual trajectory uh, of our uh, global carbon emissions. I already talked to you about the aerosol masking and committed warming. If we continue to implement the policies that are now in place, we're going to reduce this cooling impact and reveal more warming. Now, how much that's going to add to, we don't know yet. Greatest uncertainty in the climate system. This is just one projection of the sort of warming that we're already committed to. We've realized a warming of about 0.8 degrees now. But according to some of the leading scientists who've been looking at these aerosol contributions, if we shut off everything today, if a global pandemic wiped out humanity and we just let the climate system equilibrate, their calculations are that in a best case world, very low probability, we've got at least 1.5 degrees of warming as of 2005. And we've already added another half decade worth of warming to this. And more likely, we're well over two degrees into dangerous climate change. What does all of this mean? All this means that in the last decade, scientists in particular have become increasingly concerned that we're not doing as a global community what needs to be done to avoid dangerous climate change. This was the motivation for Paul Crutzen, uh, a Nobel laureate who'd won his uh, Nobel Prize for identifying the mechanism behind ozone depletion, behind CFCs causing ozone depletion. In 2006, he used his, his podium as a Nobel laureate in order to suggest, you know, if we don't start mitigating climate change, if we don't start reducing our emissions drastically, we may have to do something as desperate as solar geoengineering of the type I just described in order to avoid really catastrophic damages to ecosystems and societies, to biodiversities and societies. And the frame that I've been taking to this while working on the governance issues and doing some of the scientific review studies is thinking about climate vulnerability. Where are the places that are most vulnerable to climate change? You know, this is, this is just one of many sorts of representations of this that all give essentially the same message. The developing world in the mid-latitudes are the, some of the most vulnerable places to climate change. Now, this is a compilation of both the sorts of environments that they live in and the subsistence farming and the, and the sorts of subsistence farming lifestyles that they live, the, the reliance on the local environment much more than we're fairly sheltered from the sorts of climate changes we have here, but our agricultural systems and our water resources aren't necessarily. Here, they're not even sheltered from the basic changes. So in this sort of a lens with all of these motivations, how does geoengineering, how does the idea of solar geoengineering start to play into the governance realm? To summarize uh, a lot of what's happened in the last couple of years, the discussion has emerged primarily through scientific organizations and non-governmental organizations beginning to look at and raise the ethical governance and policy issues associated with people starting to research geoengineering technologies and starting to ask the question, how will decisions be made uh, about geoengineering? Or more importantly, how should they be made versus how will they be made? So 
the travels that I've been doing to these different regions and countries is to try and uh, to have conversations with their leading scientists and with their policymakers about the emergence of geoengineering technologies. Right now, nobody has built the aircraft with the spray nozzle to go and inject sulfur particles in the stratosphere. But lots of different components of that are starting to be researched from doing engineering studies of the high altitude airplanes to thinking about to doing modeling studies on the types of aerosol particles to people even publishing papers suggesting we could do our own designer nanoparticles in order to exert even greater climate control. Now in the next five to ten years this research is going to continue to take off. Um, there are research programs primarily right now in Europe, uh, the US and Canada but now these visits to China, to India, to uh, Africa, to South America were because programs are starting to emerge there. And the way these uh, technologies get thought about and the way the, the frames, the ethical frames or the policy frames that get put on the development of these technologies will matter a lot. So let me give you an example. What is your internal reaction to the idea of the development of these technologies being carried out by the US military in their research labs. There are clearly the ability for a single country to impact the global climate system clearly raises potential national interests. It clearly raises the possibility that individual countries are going to see climate risks or climate threats to agriculture, to water supplies, whether real or imagined doesn't necessarily matter. There are going to be geopolitical implications of climate change and when you start to discuss ways of reducing particular types of climate change or particular impacts, it begins to raise those sorts of geopolitical questions. So right now with these sorts of issues evolving, there's also a question about how these most vulnerable populations that I pointed out, ones that right now don't contribute nearly as much per capita to CO2 emissions, to global climate change, but are disproportionately suffering the results, how will they be represented in the conversation? How are they going to be engaged in the decisions about which of these technologies are developed, how and when? Um, very briefly, the sort of research work I've been doing to support the policy engagement that my team and I have been doing is to break it down in a very simple framework of who are the actors, what are the issues, and what are the various institutions that might be involved in governing the emergence of geoengineering technologies. Basically the development, the testing, the first stages of turning technologies from ideas into practical implementable realities. The issues that all intersect with climate change are all going to be on the table for geoengineering as well. One of the ones that I focus on quite a lot is development and the concept of responsibility to protect. Do we have a responsibility to develop these technologies, solar geoengineering technologies, in a way that might be able to reduce the climate impacts being experienced in the most vulnerable parts of the world? That's a very idealistic notion. And I don't think I'd be working in this area if I didn't have some bits of idealism left in me, despite the realpolitik of this. Um, but the politics of getting that sort of a frame put on these technologies is incredibly difficult because there are international security issues. There are government tendencies to view it through a national framework and a national lens of how might these technologies reduce our climate impacts, potentially regardless of other impacts outside, or how do those get dealt with through the international climate negotiations. Right now, the international climate negotiations have continued to be stymied on just getting agreement on carbon reduction. It hasn't even talked about geoengineering or anything like it so far. It hasn't even, the reason why the IMO went ahead and made that decision without impact, input on the climate side is partly because the climate negotiations have been unable to take on aerosols or take on other issues beyond CO2 because of how deadlocked the politics are. So under this framework, how, with these technologies emerging, how do you take these issues into effect? Particularly when this is the sort of institutional framework that you have to deal with. This is uh, uh, one representation by Cohane and Victor of the various institutions involved just in carbon politics today. Of course you have the UN regime, the UNFCCC climate negotiations, the IPCC expert assessments, but WMO, UNEP, FAO, UNDP, uh, bilateral initiatives, clubs like the G20, 
development banks that actually fund projects for mitigation or adaptation on the ground. All of these institutions have various influence over right now how carbon politics are going to evolve and geoengineering could play through any number of these. So far the one international organization that has had that has had a anything like a significant discussion of or decision on geoengineering is the Convention on Biological Diversity. Now, the Convention on Biological Diversity is not the obvious place to go and have a climate discussion. But because non-governmental organizations, because scientific organizations trying to find a place within this complicated international landscape to have policymakers pay attention to this cutting issue, they found a willing and open audience among a certain set of policymakers within the CBD, and you ended up with something called forum shopping. NGOs or policy advocates trying to, in, trying to find an avenue for their issue to get on the agenda because they see the pressing nature of that issue. That's what has led to the evolution of the geoengineering discourse so far, and it's why uh, groups of us, so I'm part of a variety of, of different uh, scientific organizations and civil society efforts to try and raise the discussion about this, to try and encourage broader engagement before these technologies to develop to a point where there are entrenched interests, whether corporate or national, to set a framework in place for how these different entities should frame and view geoengineering technologies. And the key research, the, the key questions that, that underlie this from my perspective oh, are about legitimacy who should and will decide if and when to conduct particular types of researches, whether the generated knowledge is going to be public or owned by corporations, and if and when these technologies should ever be deployed. All of these different actors, from the scientific community through to civil society, can play a role in shaping this. But at the early stages of these sorts of issues emerging into the front line of policy, there's normally only small cliques of individuals who have become involved for any number of reasons with the issue who end up framing and setting a lot of the agenda. Developing a broader conversation early in the emergence of, the of these sorts of technologies has at least the opportunity to create a broader democratic discourse about them. And that's been underlying a lot of the efforts that I've been pushing on. So final thoughts. Um, a Rawlsian opportunity, but not for long. So uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, uh, Rawls, the philosopher? Only a few. So Rawls, ba uh, the basic premise that I'm referring to here is Rawls postulated that if you wanted to create the most equitable society, the best way to do it would be to get somebody before they were born. Now, this is philosophy, not science. You can do this. <laughs> You get someone before they were born, and you get them to design the entire societal system, but you do so without telling them where they're going to be put in the society. They could be born as a bum, they could be born as the next president of the United States, but get them to design the system so that they could be anywhere within that. And you will end up with them designing, ideally, the most equitable system. It's a nice philosophy. It basically says that if you're ignorant about what you're going to get out of the outcome, you're probably going to design it as fair as possible so that no matter where you end up, you're going to get a reasonable fair share. Now, at this point in time, for these solar geoengineering type technologies, we are behind a veil of ignorance. We don't have a lot of scientific understanding about the type of climate change we'll get from implementing them. And we don't, as a result, have much sense of what the value would be to different nation states of trying to push for different types of deployment. We can make some guesses. Canada and Russia aren't going to like the Arctic refreezing because of energy resources, and mid-latitude countries suffering because uh, heat waves and crop failures due to drought and sorry, crop failures due to drought and heat waves uh, related to climate change. There's probably at least at the moment some evidence to suggest that there will be winners and losers from this sort of cooling. But we don't have enough evidence, we don't have enough for people to really be clear and say, yes, I would support this or not. Which means at least for a little while, there's an opportunity before the science starts telling us exactly who's going to be a winner and who's going to be a loser, that we could potentially develop a more equitable governance system. Now, one of the proposals along this line is national first movers, those countries that are developing the biggest research programs to begin with, are going to have a disproportionate impact in framing things. Going back to the example, if the US government suddenly decided we need a solar geoengineering research program and we're going to put it in the US military, that's going to send a very interesting signal 
to the international community versus putting it in a public, open, transparent research program where international cooperation is uh, not only encouraged but almost required to encourage an internationalization of these, of these sorts of technologies. Again, nice ideas. Now with China and India and, and uh, South America beginning to develop, beginning to think about their research programs, how these first ones emerge are going to matter a lot. Now, one of the proposals I put forward with, with some colleagues was a, a set of three basic principles that should guide international, should guide these national programs in terms of setting the right precedent internationally. All field testing should have, now field testing means when you actually want to fly your airplane and spray a little bit of sulfur to see if it works and to see maybe what some of the impacts are, any sort of field test like that should have broad and legitimate international approval before happening. Now, there's actually an example in the United Kingdom right now where the government funded uh, a research program to fly a balloon one kilometer in the atmosphere to spray water vapor. This was just meant to be a test, just to be an engineering test. But it raised such a political uh, tsunami, at least locally within the UK, that they ended up postponing the experiment pending further review. Now, this was, there were decisions made internal to the process that not enough public engagement had been done, but also there were uh, public statements about this coming out, protesting it, not because the experiment itself was going to do anything harmful. Water vapor sprayed in the atmosphere wasn't going to do anything, but because of the precedent that it sets, because the development of these technologies, because publicly signaling that the government is funding the development of these technologies has slippery slope ramifications. Once you start developing it, how do you stop it from cascading into a full-scale technology that's developed and then eventually, because interest groups will form behind it, deployed? To address that in some ways, the second proposal is that all research should be in the public domain and all technologies should be in the public domain. In other words, I'm not too keen on the idea of Boeing or Halliburton owning solar geoengineering technologies because once you cre create a lobby group for these sorts of uh, technologies, a group that has developed them and is therefore interested in having them funded and deployed, that creates a political structure that we may not want for something that has such an impact on the global commons. Now, to go along with this, I will just quickly say that because it's less than a billion dollars a year to cool the global climate down by a couple of degrees, a billion dollars a year is actually chump change for most international corporations. So from that point of view, this actually doesn't have a lot of financial interest associated with owning the technology to do it, which is one of the, one of the few advantages of how cheap and accessible this technology is. Uh, of course, there are plenty of corporate interests that will be impacted by the results of this, but not in terms of owning it. And the final thing is that all research should incorporate international collaborators. One of, the one of the projects that I'm working on right now is to try and encourage the creation of international research programs so that it at least creates the normative framework. It creates the foundation uh, of, of messaging that these technologies are so important not just to national interest but to global interest and humanity's future that we need to treat these as part of the global commons. Now again, this is all quite idealistic and quite based around the idea that the most vulnerable populations are the ones that need the most protection, the underlying ethical premise. Um, but it underlies a lot of my work with the idea that if we start moving these ideas forward, even though all of achieving all of this may not be possible, at least it sets the normative foundations to which policymakers attempting to push other agendas or interests attempting to push other agendas will have to respond will have to be in a position to address why these sorts of principles should not be followed in the development of them. So with that, I'd love to get your perspectives on this. Please. All right, so you're, you're correct that in IPCC, we stayed way away from this topic for the fourth assessment. And I'm trying to think of what the international approval mechanism might be. Now, I think the Convention on Biological Diversity, they just last fall, and you probably know the policy part of this way better. Uh, I think the UN passed a plan to start, in effect, a, a, an IPCC-like assessment process. IPBES. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. Do you see as that being the sort of 
forum for it isn't really set up for approving no studies. it's for uh, an assessment of, of current research so would, where would be the forum that you'd imagine so uh, very good question one that I'm grappling with right now um, it, it, let me just take a step back quickly though um, the IPCC in its fourth assessment report, you're right, you, you stayed well away. In the fifth assessment report, though, it is actually going to, geoengineering technologies are going to be assessed and reviewed. Is that in working group three? It's actually in working groups one, two, and three there will be elements. So I, I was on the steering group for the IPCC expert meeting on geoengineering, which happened back in June in our report uh, because for many reasons, including some of the controversy associated with this, was not a one-week writing process. It's taken us a while to massage it. But that report's just coming out. So the IPCC is going to do an assessment of the science of these technologies, as well as Working Group 3 will do an assessment of the current literature on governance. Not governance recommendations, but what people have said about ways to govern this so far. Um, but you're right. IPCC is not a decision-making body. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, even whispering that, I'm sure you, it, it, if you even whisper that the IPCC should take on policy recommendations, you watch the, the working group chairs run from the room lighting their hair on fire. I mean, because they know the political process associated with that. The IPCC is designed, what, what is the exact phrase? Policy relevant, but not yeah, policy, policy prescriptive. prescriptive. So in other words, we, it, exactly. So we can, we can tell you what the science says, but we can't tell you what to do. Yeah. Um, now there's a lot of advantage to that. It means that you know it's not loaded with agendas on you know telling people what to do because anytime you you start telling people what to do, there's all sorts of interest groups that are going to be impacted with that, and you want to try and steer clear of that. But it's not a decision making body. It's not even very much a decision support body from the point of view that particular policymakers who want to get more information about a particular decision they're making can't turn to the IPCC and say, "Can you evaluate this for me?" It's actually, I think, one of the shortcomings of IPCC. There's a, in the, there's a few topics where you get big special reports yeah, on it. By and large. But by and large, I mean, it's, it's one of the things I'll talk about a little bit more tomorrow night. I mean, most decisions about infrastructure that we build are made at the city level or city to, to state level. They're not generally made at the federal level. Yeah. And when you think about the infrastructure we build today is locking in our future, that's where the real advice support is required, but we have that much institutional design for it. I'm getting off track. Um, on geoengineering, in terms of scientific research, I think far more likely is a place like the International Council for Science, ICSU, ICSU yeah. the World Climate Research Program, um, uh, Diversitas, uh, IGBP, IHDP, you've even got the, the human dimension. So all of these acronyms, basically the international, it used to be called the uh, ICSU, International Council of Scientific Unions, and is now just called the International Council for Science, is basically a, a network of scientific unions or the sort of scientific societies like American Physical Society, American Chemical Society, etc. All of them are part of ICSU. All the major ones are part of ICSU. And ICSU runs four major projects related to environmental change in the world. One on biodiversity, one on global biosphere, geosphere, one on human dimensions, and one on climate. That's the sort of place where international scientists come together. They're underfunded. They're looking for ways to work together. But those, you know, this is the sort of topic that I'm trying to nudge and push. And actually, at a conference that uh, Dane joined me at up in Ottawa, we had um, uh, Gordon McBain there, who's the president-elect. You know Gordon. So president-elect of ICSU. And oh, he is? OK. Yeah, he's now the president-elect. So, so, so again, to just give a, a very specific example, most policy gets made to some extent by the networks you have and who you know, and that's not necessarily going back to the should question, how it should work in a democratic society, but 90% of agenda setting really comes from making the connections to the people who have the podium at the moment when you need an issue put on the table. And that, that is where a lot of these ethical issues end up getting played out in, get played out in practice, because the person with the microphone at the right time that captures the public framing of an issue has disproportionate influence on shaping the future conversation. Um, considering that I think one of the biggest things we've learned through uh, trying to understand climate change better is how little we realize about you know the effects of our actions. Yep. Um, what do you think about you know just sort of you know tempering all of this with the thought that maybe we're flying a little bit too close to the sun with wax wings? 
we just, since we don't even know what's going to happen with all this carbon that we put out there, that it's starting to fiddle with what happens with that is just sort of another step down the wrong path in some ways, or at least being too hasty with it might be. That is weighing that balance is going to be one of the ultimate challenges. So if you think about this as as different levels of decisions, if you were the unilateral dictator of the planet, you would need to make that sort of a decision and weigh that. In other words, what are the risks? Now, for me personally, when I think about this, uh, one analogy that I use is chemotherapy. I assume you're pretty healthy right now. Injecting you with chemotherapy would be a pretty nasty thing to do to you at this point in time. But if you have cancer, if you have cancer from a lifetime of smoking or from any other source, suddenly the injection of radiation into your body doesn't seem like quite an such an insane thing to do. Of course, there's risks. And making that balance, in the case of cancer and in the case of chemotherapy, it's an individual choice. You get to make that choice for yourself. The doctor will provide you all the information. The doctor becomes your IPCC, and you make your own choice. You get multiple doctor's opinions, and you make your choice about the risks of whether or not it's, t it's taking too much risk. Now, we have a lot more information about radiation treatment and chemotherapy in response to cancer than we do about the climate system. But we also, despite all of the uncertainty that we have about solar radiation management impacts or solar geoengineering impacts on the climate system, we also have a huge amount of uncertainty about what the future impacts of carbon will be, about the global warming that we're suffering. And there are some communities in the world that are already, you know, if you're a low-lying island state, for example, you're looking at a future of 30 to 50 years. And the trajectory is pretty clear on that. There's no, there is some ambiguity, but not a lot. Um, and suddenly, the idea of cooling the climate system down to avoid that sort of an outcome, from their point of view, the, the risk, risk trade-off may look very different than a risk-risk trade-off in different parts of the world, which takes you down to the next level of decision-making, which is, how do you do it when you've got 7 billion people on the planet and not everybody's vote actually counts as much as we may wish it does in a practical world right now you can't we don't have a mechanism for asking 7 billion people to raise their hands and make a decision we also don't necessarily have a mechanism for saying that your vote should count less because you're in a more secure environment than the more vulnerable populations there's no easy answer to your question i think the reason why we have seen the explosion of discussion about geoengineering and the beginnings of increasing research in geoengineering is because enough people reached the precipice where they said, we have to at least look at this. Because their concern about everything we've done so far just got that, got high enough to nudge them into that. Not everyone's there. Not, I'm not saying where any specific individual should be. I spend more of my time talking about how we set up the governance framework to talk about this than trying to advocate any position on it. Yeah. yeah, Jason, I was wondering, you know, legitimacy is really key in this whole thing. And also, you know, putting the interest of the most vulnerable people. Or, and, I, and I kind of see a, a conflict between sort of paternalism and, you know, and legitimacy. In the sense that you'd like to protect the most vulnerable, but then getting them to see, like, a U.S., UK, Canadian science, and people that are interested in being a legitimate representative of their interest. So I see there's this, almost to me seems like a, a, a real, something that almost can't be overcome between a sense of paternalism, legitimacy, and the desire to protect the most vulnerable, and the most vulnerable people having an adequate understanding and level of trust to allow this to go forward in a legitimate way. It isn't just sort of um, quite, quite candid. Oh, it's very clear. I, I, I'm just trying to think of how to phrase this. Quite candidly, this is a personal issue that I've been wrestling yeah. with because I was uh, one of the main activities that I focused on in the fall was uh, a set of workshops we ran in Ethiopia and in South Africa, in the, in the African Pavilion of the UN Climate Change, and in Ethiopia with the African Climate Policy Center at the first annual what was this? Uh, a CCDA, Climate Change and Development in Africa conference. We ran a side event on geoengineering. I was the Western speaker there. I was the one doing the introduction to technology. I am very clearly not African. Um, and this was initiated because Yuba Sakona, uh, one of the working group chairs on IPCC, ACPC head, whatever, invited me to come and do it. Uh, but nonetheless, 
you know, showing up in that sort of, or doing it in India, or doing it in China. You know, these are, these are ideas that have developed primarily, for better or worse, out of Western, uh, what's the right way to put this, Western environmental tradition in some ways. You know, the, the, there is plenty of environmental tradition in the East about climate, mod or about, sorry, environmental uh, modification in some ways as well, but the original ideas for geoengineering date back to the 1960s and 50s where people were thinking about what could we do with nuclear bombs that's more useful than blowing each other up? Oh, I know, we could blow up the Arctic sea ice because that'll warm up the northern hemisphere. Okay, um, you know, these were interesting ideas that people explored, but it was sort of that, it, that engineering and technological history uh, that, that led to all this. Going into those places now, go, I think it is critically important that they develop their own perspectives on it. And so the only way that i found to sort of deal with that is to go in and say, Look, these ideas are, uh, they've been developed by these groups of people. They've emerged for these reasons in, in Western culture. Um, frankly, even in the West, we you know, th there's, not, there's no such thing as a convergent position within uh, Western society on this. And I would be shocked if there was anything like a convergent position in any of these cultures. Um, so starting the conversation is the most important part to get those divergent perspectives engaged as early as possible. The reason I... One of the big attractors about geoengineering as a topic to discuss is the fact that because it goes to such an extreme in the way we look at planetary, the way we look at our relationship with the future climate system, with our future, um, it raises a lot of the issues that got buried in the climate discussion when it became about carbon politics and a price on carbon. And it was simply about getting the right price on carbon and not managing all of the different things that were, you know, it wasn't about the broader conversation. This forces the broader conversation back open, if for no other reason than because geopolitically, a billion dollars a year is something AOSIS, the association of island states, could potentially do with their technologies. In other words, go to the climate negotiations in 2015 when they're supposed to be setting their new ambitions, and if the ambitions aren't high enough, put a big red button on the table and say, if you don't mitigate, we're just going to cool the climate down with sulfur and be damned with the results because we know we're going to be better off in this world than anything else. It would be an interesting negotiating position, um, one that would probably have trade ramifications and all sorts of other realpolitik implications. So it's not, as a feasible strategy, it might not be there. But as an act of social defiance in order to raise the, uh, the, the gravity of the issues being faced, it might be possible ramification. So I've, we gotta go. there, there, there are, I, I'm happy to stay around and chat for a little while, so maybe uh, if other people need to go, because I know this has run a little long, I apologize for that, but I'm happy to keep chatting.